Well, it blinks green, I guess. Um, but on the dichotomy you mentioned, I, I might feel a little differently. It matters because it matters to the credibility of the judiciary as an institution, to society. People look at us and say, who are these people? Why do they have power? Why are they deciding things for us? Are they us or are they somebody else? Who are they? And we need to be society. We need to be them. We need to have that credibility. So it's important for that. It's important for people to be able to come up to those levels, to be, for women to be able to help other women, for people of color to help other people of color. And I think that, yes, any institution, a workplace, a school, any kind of institution is better off for the people who are in it. The people who are in it are going to learn more, become wise, be, become more empathetic by being around all different kinds of people and learning from them. So I think it's that that aspect of it is totally true. What I would not say is to say, well, women make better decisions or cases come out differently if a woman is deciding it or a person of color is deciding it. I think that is not something I would want to say, even though I might think so. Um, <laughs> but I do think that judges, like students, like doctors, like lawyers, like anybody else, will become wiser, will learn more, will be more empathetic if they are around other people and understand what other people's experience was like. So I think that's plenty of reason without going into questions of whether actual decisions might come out differently. And everyone should feel free to mention what they would think but not say. <laughs> That's fine. We encourage that here. Okay. Justice Kantil Sakaui, what how, how do you feel about this question? Well, I, I think it's a great question, and I think it bears repeating because we have so many young women and young ethnic lawyers entering the law that it's really important to go back and look at history and sort of recap it. But let me also say first what a pleasure it is to be here, and thank you for celebrating this anniversary. It's important that we don't forget the struggle and that we're here, and I, it's a really a pleasure to be here with my colleague, Justice Werdegar, who is an inspiration and a leader and continues to be the Day. Thank you, Kay, for being here with me. Um, I believe that diversity and women's leadership matters for all the same reasons that Chief Judge Wilkins says. But I will say, coming through the ranks in the last 24 years, my experience has been, you know, it's women judges who came up with the idea of, be, of changing diversity, being role models, and being a voice to others to consider the position of judgeships or to consider the position of partnerships or equity partnerships. It is women judges who bring that idea to others and spread it. But in terms of decisions about diversity and uh, women's leadership, let me say that in my experience, uh, domestic violence courts and uh, dependency courts and children's courts and family courts and uh, human trafficking issues would not be at the forefront that we have today without the input of female leaders in the judiciary, in the profession, in the law profession. It is true. Uh, Thank you. It is true that on most applications of the law, statutory construction of complicated areas of law, CEQA, um, uh, civil litigation, we will likely come to the same decision as our male counterparts. But because uh, of being a woman and because having coming from a culture, I think we think a little broader. I think we think beyond the question. I think we are more concerned about the consequences, not that our male counterparts are, but we bring a different perspective. And it's evident in some of the initiatives that have been taken up in the judiciary uh, today. So I attribute a lot of growth and a lot of cutting edge ideas, not only to the decisions, but to women's leadership in the law as a profession and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. That's a sign. Do you want to? Well, you know what? Um... He can hear my... oh. Do you have a mic? If you Here's a mic. mic sitting on. If you press the button, is it green? Now blinking green. Give a test. Oh, now you turned it off. Press it again. It should be green. Well, here, use mine. <laughs> here it's green. Here you go. For you. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. You know, you put a bunch of kids together, and uh, they're playing, and they're boys and girls, and they have an issue, and what you hear from little kids 
It ain't fair. Fair, fair, fair. And they talk about it. And they talk about it at a very early age. And that concept of fairness pervades humanity as it grows up and as it interacts. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, the fact of women in the judiciary is just a question of basic fairness, okay? But I must say that my whole perspective today has been skewed by virtue of my looking at the uh, front page of the LA Times and um, looking at this article of Syrian victims of sexual crime live in silence. And uh, the number of women who are being subjected to massive daily rape on a huge scale. And, uh, you know, I don't know that we have ever been through anything like that in the United States of America. We, the women have not been treated as fairly as they might be up and down the line. But when I think of th this is going on in this day and age, and what is the possibility of those women having any kind of protection, any kind of say? Is there anybody there? Where are the women? And we have established, after we established the uh, National Association of Women Judges, and it was a pretty successful operation, and it is, and it is, and it is. We have established the International Association of Women Judges, and I do not know if those women are going to be able to have any impact uh, on what is happening to women in some of these countries where the women are treated less than chattels, less than chattels. And somebody said, well, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, well, shoot, there are a lot of things. And maybe I'll get active in the International Association. Maybe I'll go help uh, some of those women who are having some problems around. And my good friend, Judge Judy Churlin, says, well, you get involved in that, and they'll give you your head on a platter. But the point is, the point is, we have achieved a great deal in the United States of America uh, for a whole lot of reasons. So the concepts of fairness abound in the very beginning of this country. And with all the fairness concepts that came forward during the process of our trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment adopted, that permeated a lot of thinking also. And so we are in a fairness mode in the United States of America with respect to a lot of issues. And of course, uh, one of them is uh, women on the bench. And I go right back to when all the little kids are playing together. Fairness. What is fairness? And women now in the United States of America have arrived at a point of functioning as reasonable, satisfying, uh, competent uh, human beings to the point of where fairness demands that they have input to big time decision making. You know, we got a woman who's thinking now, my God, of running for president of the United States. <laughs> wow, we. And, and we have women in our uh, Congress and women governors and women in the judiciary. So we are tried and true at, at, uh, in terms of having had uh, been exposed to enough situations and had to react to those situations and done a credible job in connection therewith that fairness says, hey, you know, it would be unfair not to have half of the citizens of the United States or half of the citizens of the world not having input into major decisions, whether they be on the bench, in politics, on the playing field, wherever they be. So, you know, I, it's, it's just, it's not even out there anymore. Uh, but, again, you know, I, uh, I don't know what we're going to do about this. Mm -hmm. I tell you, I don't know what we're going to do about this. This article just gives me, oh, God, uh, the way these uh, women are treated and uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
they're less than chattels. They're less than animals. And, uh, and I see us sitting here all dressed up jazzy in our outfits and this lady on the Supreme Court and all you women lawyers sitting out there and we're kind of smug in who we are. Huh? And um, that really brought me down today. Mm -hmm. Really brought me down. So if my comments are skewed in some sense or not as professional as they might be, that's the reason. Sorry about that. No, no, I think that... Um, and I, actually, I think that comparative point is a really important one. Um, you know, my organization represents women that suffer terrible injustices every day. They're raped at the ferry building. They're raped in the fields. And yet they know they can find in my organization and the courts a place that they can have a voice and have justice. And I really feel like their comfort level and their ability to know that they can um, they can find recourse comes from the leadership of women lawyers they can go to and women on the bench who they know will believe them or at least give them a fair shot, a listen. So I thank you for that. Um, so let me ask you, um, Justice Klein, if I can follow up a little bit. Justice Ginsburg in the Hobby Lobby cri uh, case criticized her male, ju her male colleagues for having a blind spot on women's issues. And you've been on the bench for a long time, as, as, as have our other panelists. Um, and it's a view that I've thought about a lot, having lost twice um, in the Supreme Court in sex discrimination cases brought during my tenure at ERA. Great bio fodder that doesn't make. Um, <laughs> and, and so without naming names, of course, unless you're compelled to do so or you want to think it out loud or, you know. <laughs> I, I just want to know, if you, have you experienced colleagues or attorneys appearing before you that you feel have blind spots with respect to issues impacting women or racial m minorities? And, um, or do you have that sense from opinions you've read? Who are you talking to? <laughs> Justice Klein, I'll start with Me? you. Me? When I was first on the bench, male lawyers would come in there and they would call me Deary and Honey and uh, everything but Your Honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lot of trouble uh, getting the lawyers up to speed on that one to the point <laughs> where I'd bring them up to the bench and say, one more Honey and you're going to be held in contempt. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> seriously, seriously, we... The first women who were appointed to the bench uh, had a horrendous time uh, bringing around uh, to a way of thinking of looking at us as members of the judiciary first and women second and treating us in that in that fashion and giving us the respect that the law deserves. Not that any one of us was concerned about that. I couldn't give a hoot whether the guy liked me or otherwise. But the point is, I was a representative of the entire system. And I'm sitting there as a member of the judiciary making a determination and trying to make a determination that has some weight and substance when this guy's calling me honey and the jurors are looking at me like, are you a honey? Or are you the, the judge in charge of this sort of thing? It took us a long time to uh, get some of these people up to speed. And I must say now, of course, it's an entirely different situation What with our having a chief justice who is an extraordinary, outstanding, bright, competent female. Boy, that does help, believe me. And the fact that we've got three women sitting on the uh, uh, Supreme Court of the United States, uh, incredible, incredible women. And all up and down the judiciary now you have uh, women who have uh, handled themselves in such a fashion as to be uh, credible, respected, uh, part and parcel of the system which is the judicial system in the United States of America. It's been a huge change mm -hmm. over the years. And I will say that some of us who've been around a while have had <laughs> input in that regard because we have stood up and, and conducted ourselves in a, in a manner 
that demanded the respect. And uh, as a consequence, we gained it, and we we set a standard uh, by which other women appointed to the bench could be accepted as the kind of people they were supposed to be uh, as first-class uh, interpreters of the law and fair and equitable, but that took some doing, believe me. And sitting on the bench since 63, I'll tell you, I've seen a difference, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Just like a gavel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.